So I'm sure some of the people in good old Atlanta last night were very concerned about the threat of ISIS trying to bomb WWE Survivor Series. Well, you had to know that the group was going to be smart enough to realize, hey, the WWE was going to do a good enough job of throwing out some bombs Sunday night. Why sit there and gum up the works? Why sit there and take the focus off of the big spectacular of a bomb that was Survivor Series 2015? Not good. That should really surprise anybody, but really not good. This event was bad, very bad. It was literally like Vince put on a suicide bomber's vest in the creative meeting and just decided to blow everything all the fucking smithereens. This was bad. I know it. You know it. And everybody else damn sure and well knows it too. We kicked off with the two semi-final matches. The winners of each match would go on to fight for the belt in the main event to close the show. And I have to say that I was somewhat disappointed because these matches felt more like Raw one-hour main events or maybe, if you want to be very generous, Raw main events than pay-per-view worthy, let alone pay-per-view matches where the fucking world title was potentially at stake. Because if you don't win the semi-final match... You don't go on to have a shot to wrestle for it in the finals and potentially hold the gold at the end of the night. Now, everybody knew how Roman Reigns and ADR was going to go down. And I think once that went down, everybody for sure was probably convinced how Dean Ambrose and Kevin Owens was going to go down. In terms of the two matches, I actually liked Reigns and Del Rio a little bit more. Maybe it was because I would have liked to have seen Ambrose and Owens get more time to do more things. Um, I think the guys tried the best they could given the situation and circumstances. And there were moments where you felt like these guys were fighting for something pretty important. But you didn't really get the sense, for me anyways, in either one of these matches, that everything was on the line that it was all about winning this match, and they would do whatever it took to win this match. Like I said, it felt like a couple of TV matches, not a couple of pay-per-view worthy matches, where they're fighting for the right to potentially hold the biggest prize in the sport at the end of the night. I didn't expect a whole lot much more than this, but just because my expectations were met doesn't mean it's good either. And this, sadly, the two semifinal matches, were probably the damn highlight of the night, other than the Taker match. Well, I guess I got my answer about whether or not they were going to do a traditional 5-on-5 five -five Survivor Series tag. They did, and I'm sorry I asked for it. What a drizzling pile of shit this fucking thing was. Instead of actually building up a match like this, and even bothering to let us know the participants ahead of time going into this, he is randomly throwing this shit out there. Now, here's what I can't fucking understand. You've got the Dudley Boys. Only the fucking WWE can make the Dudley Boys coming back completely and totally fucking irrelevant. You decided to give this spot to the fucking Lucha Dragons instead. Even over the primetime players. Holy Christ almighty. I understand the Usos in the mix and Ryback in the mix. You want to feature them on the pay-per-view. Good deal. Could we have put them in a situation where this actually fucking mattered? And then the way they booked this match... You do so much to feature the New Day so strongly starting off the match, just so that way you job out Big E like a fucking jackass, and then the freaking New Day goes running back, so that way your Money in the Bank winner, Sheamus, is left to get the shit kicked out of him for a few minutes. Your Money in the Bank winner, I've never understood this phenomenon of the WWE of, let's take the guy we're trying to build up to be a future world champion and have him job out every fucking chance we get. Instead, we have him basically get his ass kicked, by a Uso and fucking Callisto. Callisto doesn't fucking matter. Holy shit. Who writes this shit? Who books this shit? It's bad enough this was a random fucking match that was terrible with a horrible finish, but you made your Money in the Bank winner look like a complete and total puss and then expect that to all go away with what you did at the end of the fucking night. That's why people are pissed off about this product. That's why people can't stand this shit. It's because of bullshit like this. Now, let's be fair. 
After the two semifinal matches, the only other thing that was going to be of any consequence on this show was going to be the Brothers of Destruction versus the Wyatt Family and the main event for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. So it was going to be filler and shit we didn't give a damn about. Sure as hell didn't give a damn about the Survivor Series traditional tag match. That shit was terrible. Frankly, the Divas match was fucking terrible, too. Paige's character is fucking stupid. And if anything, a personification of the ridiculousness of what the fan base of professional wrestling has become today. Because these are the type of women you want featured. Can we at least have decent-looking fucking women? If the storytelling is going to suck, is this company can't create new fucking stars, and they can't book their way out of a paper bag, can I at least have some fucking decent eye candy? Not this stupid bitch. Holy hell Christ. You want to talk about how stupid the wrestling fan base, especially the hardcore fan base, has become? I present to you Exhibit A fucking page. But seriously, this whole feud is stupid. This match was stupid. The fact that they got to this point just to have Charlotte go over Paige completely clean, meaning there was no real story to begin with, so why do the shit that you did on Raw is just fucking stupid. Just like Tyler Breeze versus Dolph Ziggler, being on the actual main fucking card was fucking stupid. You take something with a new character that most of the regular WWE audience, Newsflash, doesn't give a shit about with a guy that even the most ardent of supporters are starting to give less a shit about and Dolph Ziggler. You do all this shit with them on SmackDown, who most people aren't even fucking watching anyways, and you sit there and throw this out there as a fucking lame-ass pay-per-view match. This company sucks. And even though I know that there was going to be a new WWE World Heavyweight Champion at the end of the night, the thing I was most interested in on this entire show, the only reason I really honestly fucking bothered to tune in and watch Survivor Series, was to see the Brothers of Destruction take on the Wyatt family. And it had absolutely nothing to do with the lame-ass Wyatt family. It just didn't. This was a celebration of The Undertaker! 25 years. Two and a half decades. To put this in perspective, when The Undertaker debuted at Survivor Series 1990, George H.W. Bush was the president. I was nine years old. And the Detroit Pistons were the defending NBA champions behind Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars. That's how long this guy's been around. And you watch this match, and to me, it was all about The Undertaker, and that's fine. I had my moment here. I know I talked about the fact that this whole thing was kind of lose-lose, and in a way, I kind of still stand behind that. But... There's kind of that cool nostalgia pop for having the Brothers of Destruction, uh, you know, pair up one more time at a big event. You know, it was kind of cool to be able to go down memory lane and uh, see The Undertaker again. And it's been a real treat for me in 2015 to see a guy like The Undertaker wrestle his fourth pay-per-view match of the year. And he just doesn't have to. He just doesn't need to. And yet he does. And he can still go out there and command an audience like nobody's business. He can still own the night and take over a show. And that's exactly what the hell he did yet again at Survivor Series 2015. To me, a wrestler's wrestler, the epitome of a WWE superstar who's been able to change and evolve over the years and still find a way to be relevant. If anybody in the history of the business as an in-ring performer, as a character, as a personality deserves your respect and admiration, it's this man. Because he just doesn't have to do it. But he still does. And while sure some of you will say, well, this tag match, they had the Wyatt family moves. They fucking lose everything anyway, so what the hell is the difference? At least he's losing to they're losing to fucking Kane and The Undertaker, and at least Bray Wyatt wasn't doing the job here any damn ways. Do you really think that they were going to put over the Wyatt family when this was one of two things that this show was about? And one of them was about The Undertaker and celebrating his 25-year freaking legacy with the company. The company made the absolutely right decision. They featured the right guy in the right way, 
And even though it wasn't incredibly long, and even though it didn't do a whole lot of shit, at the end of the day, this still kicked ass. Period. The one real true saving grace of this show. Unfortunately, not good enough to actually save the show, because you need a whole lot more than that with Vince's ISIS job that he did on this shit. But man, for that little moment in time, it was kick-ass to see The Undertaker and Kane back together again. It was kick-ass to see The Undertaker wrestle again in 2015, his fourth pay-per-view match of the year, when he just doesn't fucking have to. So then we get to the main event, and everybody's wondering who's going to leave the show the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. And there was always this thought process by me, and you saw it in my Survivor Series preview, that was like, no matter where the company honestly goes with this, it's going to leave you feeling unsatisfied. You're just going to sit there and go, meh. And at a time where you can do something that could shake shit up a little bit, give you at least a little bit of momentum, you would hope, going into the rest of 2015 and into 2016 and Rumble and then WrestleMania season, this was a good opportunity for the WWE to do something here. And it just left you feeling meh. Now you've got Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns. You probably knew from the beginning that this is where it was going to end up. So it was kind of predictable. You had a little bit of uncertainty on the Ambrose side, but you knew Reigns was going to make it. But you probably thought, ah, this is where they're going to want to go. And even though you could kind of predict it was coming, that doesn't necessarily mean it was bad. In fact, that doesn't mean it was bad at all. Because you've got these two guys that have literally years of history. This is kind of a full circle thing in a way that I wish would have been able to been played up more. This is something that should have been talked about more, discussed more. Even though they did the little interview after Ambrose won and Reigns comes in, you know, and they do that thing, that's fine. But these guys debuted together three years ago on Survivor Series. There's some full circle type of shit here with this. That three years later, now that Seth Rollins had his time, he split off, he sold out, had his reign, and now he's hurt. It's one of these guys could be the next potential standard bearers, the flag bearers for the WWE. And part of the problem with doing a tournament like this, where you had the two semifinal matches earlier to me, it takes away some of the buzz and the attention that should be devoted to the buildup to this match. You basically, in a lot of ways, get a two-hour build-up to your freaking most important match of the show. A two-hour build-up to your main event. And that's always a challenging thing to overcome. But to me, it's so easy here. You've got Reigns, you've got Ambrose, you've got their time together as, as members of the Shield. Their debut going back to Survivor Series 2012. The fact that you're still playing up that they're great friends, and now these great friends have to face off, and one of them is going to fuck over their best friend. I mean, it's like storytelling 101. There's so many different directions you could go with this, and it could be potentially really, really good and create, down the road, some interesting, compelling television. No matter how you got to this point, you could really do something with this. So it was really, frankly, a shame to see how this all played out. These two guys tried to tell a story. These two guys tried to make this work. But I don't think it really worked, in part because the match was, what, like 10 minutes and that's it? I mean, this is a match with everything at stake. Two best friends now having to fight each other, knowing that the only thing that matters more than their friendship is that WWE World Heavyweight Championship, and they can't even get more than 10 fucking minutes to settle the debate. It felt rushed. It didn't feel like it was a match with everything on the line. And then you get to the finish that was just bad. It was like thrown together and completely out of fucking nowhere. This is the shit I used to knock TNA for in terms of their randomly thrown in finishes that didn't build up to anything and made no sense and gave you an unsatisfying feeling because of the lack of payoff with it. And you could see that there was a lack of payoff into the finish of this match. Because even when Roman Reigns won, it kind of went over like a thud. But I think it was because people were legitimately surprised that the match is already fucking over. So the big boos you might have anticipated for Reigns winning the belt just didn't materialize. They were there, but they weren't there with the volume and the veracity that you would expect in a key signature moment like this. 
And then, of course, the WWE goes out of their way to fucking spook the fuck out of everybody. They said, we haven't done a good enough job of bombing this show. Let's make the audience think we're bombing them now with this big rain celebration. I mean, it is literally like they took two stories worth of confetti, threw it into the mixer, and just dumped the shit down. I mean, that shit was falling every fucking where. People there at the Phillips Arena are probably pulling it out of their butt cracks still today. Holy hell. But the whole thing is, is if you're going to do this whole big hullabaloo, and you're going to do this whole big celebration, then that title match ought to be a lot better. And that finish in particular to said title match ought to damn sure and need to damn sure be a lot better, more satisfying and fulfilling and gratifying than what the fuck it was. To do that big type of celebration payoff, you actually need to give something that is worth a big time celebration payoff. And instead, the finish of the match to a flat match was flat itself. And this whole finish felt like it was overdone. It if anybody was sitting there resenting Reigns, this just makes you resent him more. It totally defeats the whole purpose. Now, granted, it was to set up Triple H coming out, to which people thought was the other real purpose of the show, which was determining who the WWE World Heavyweight Champion was. So Triple H serves himself up as a sacrificial lamb, so Sheamus could try and cash in, and eventually he does. And now we get to show the great shot of Roman Reigns in his despair. And the fact that he was so close that he could actually touch it, that he did actually touch it, that he did achieve the dream, only similar to Daniel Bryan, to have it yanked away from him by Triple H and somebody aligned with Triple H. In this case, it's Sheamus with a bro kick to the face. So now Sheamus is your new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. The same guy who was jobbing out to an Uso and Kalisto earlier on in the fucking night. The same fucking Sheamus that can't get heel heat to save his fucking life, and no, Channing, you look stupid is not heel heat. It just means he looks fucking stupid because he does. Now this asshole is the WWE World Heavyweight Champion because after a period of time of seeming to wanted to make Triple H babyface for whatever the fuck reason, now we're going to flip him back heel in a big way by aligning him with fucking Sheamus. Holy Christ, no wonder people are upset about this event. No wonder people are pissed off at the finish. Roman Reigns didn't even walk out the champ, and people are still pissed. And I understand why. But foolishly, people think that this main event was all about determining the new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Shame on you. Shame on you. As I referenced a little earlier in the video, there were two things that Survivor Series 2015 was all about. Number one was about celebrating the legacy of The Undertaker, 25 years strong and still going strong. And number two, it was about getting Triple H his WrestleMania match, period. If there's one thing I've never been able to reconcile or completely and fully understand is how any wrestling fan, or in particular WWE fan, could ever classify themselves as an atheist. You've watched this company for years. How can you believe there is no God? You see God in the flesh. And you saw it Sunday night at Survivor Series. They had to convert even the most ardent of non-believers. Because only a gloriously divine egomaniac like Hunter Hearst Helmsley, could take this grand celebration of Undertaker's 25 years with the WWE and turn it into being about him, and most importantly of all, the second thing that this show was about, and really the only thing that this show really mattered for and existed for, was to help set up Triple H's WrestleMania match. You know, every year around this time, he's, Hunter starts to get the itch. He starts to get the smell of that seven-figure payout. And by God, don't you know, at the end of the day, he's going to make sure that he gets that big feature WrestleMania match. He takes care of himself in that way as few others ever have in the entire history of the professional wrestling business. And yet some of you will still foolishly say, there is no God, there is no God. I don't know about earth and heavens and up above, but I know he walks among us and his name is Paul Levesque. How could you think anything other than that is the case? 
When you see what he managed to pull off here, instead of it being about Roman Reigns' first ever WWE World Heavyweight Championship win, or how close Dean Ambrose got to his first ever WWE Championship win, or making it about Sheamus, your Money in the Bank winner, who was cashed in successfully and is now your new WWE World Heavyweight Champion, it became about Triple H and his moment in the spotlight and his future WrestleMania match. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's very simple. The son of a bitch knows how to position himself. He knows how to angle himself. They brought in Sting specifically to work with Triple H at WrestleMania 31. Anything that Sting ever did after that was just icing on the cake. It was just fucking gravy. WrestleMania 30. It was more about Daniel Bryan versus Triple H than it was Daniel Bryan actually getting the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. WrestleMania 29 is about Brock Lesnar. Do you see the pattern here? Do you see the trend here? WrestleMania 28, 27, do I need to go on? At the end of the day, God's going to get his. Praise God. And he did here. Because now he's assured himself something short-term in terms of animosity between him and Roman Reigns, where he could be positioning himself for not one, mind you, but two big money matches coming up. Potentially two of them. He could potentially work with Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble in their own match. It could be him and Roman Reigns as the final two in the Royal Rumble match itself, for Christ's sakes. Or they could actually kick this thing down the road all the way to WrestleMania. No matter what, the son of a bitch knows how to get it done. And what I mean by get it done is not putting out compelling, entertaining wrestling television. It's about getting it done in his own pocket in terms of his own big pay-per-view payouts. You know at some point in time, Triple H is getting a big pay-per-view match with Roman Reigns. Whether that happens at the Rumble or at WrestleMania is yet to be determined. But you also know that he's secretly pining for something even bigger. Triple H knows... That he is God. And it is only fair in today's WWE that the man that's there all the time, in one capacity or another, God himself, should be on the marquee, should main event WrestleMania 32. Because if you think God doesn't have anything other in mind other than the fact that he wants to main event this show as they try to set a new indoor attendance record, you are out of your ever-loving fucking mind. Triple H is consumed by it. It is a part of every fiber of his fucking immortal being. And as a result, you know he would love nothing more than to use Roman Reigns as a platform to spring onto something even bigger, which is a match against The Rock at WrestleMania 32. Yet all the while, skillfully, with the genius that is Triple H, he set himself up no matter what. If Rock can't work WrestleMania 32, then they could kick Roman Reigns down the road. And it could be Triple H versus Roman Reigns. Oh my God, could you imagine if Triple H got his hands on the belt and he's defending the title at WrestleMania 32? Then the title is going to mean something because they'll make sure that it's going to mean something because it involves Triple H. My God, the majesty of it all. I swear I'm the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. If you haven't been converted into believers. I don't know what more evidence you need to see. God is real. God exists. And he walks among you. Well, actually, technically, on a much higher plane and plateau than you. Because he is God, after all. You saw the miracles and the magnificence of God's Sunday at Survivor Series. That show sucks. Who cares? Undertaker, 25 years? Child, please, who gives a fuck? It's all about the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. It's all about God himself, Triple H, and positioning himself for future big pay-per-view matches. No matter how much shit changes, people, always remember this. is hashtag breakfast club rules, bitches.